Um, okay, so let me just say this. It's a bit of a special day. Um, it's always a special day when we're in church, but today is a bit of a special day. Um, God is just, he kind of got a hold of me last night. Uh, got a hold of me, spoke a message to me, um, and specifically let me know that today he was going to show his power in our midst. And I want you to know that. Um, because when something like that happens and God comes in like that and gets my attention like that, what I want to do is I want to prepare notes just a little bit less and I want to pray just a little bit more. And that's the kind of day that today is. Um, we're going into uh, the fourth section in the book of James. How many of you have been enjoying James so far? James, right? So it's been this awesome book, and it's this New Testament book, and there's like five chapters to it, and it's a big sermon from a New Testament writer telling us how to live the Christian life. And it's super, super practical. He's right in our face. Remember I say he's like the Gordon Ramsay of New Testament writers. James is right in our face constantly. So if you've not left screaming yet, you're still here. You can handle it. Praise God for you. Today, we got a whole new message. And In the midst of this message, this is one of the most highly debated sections of Scripture in the entire New Testament. Um, We're not going to get into the theology debate, though, because James is going to end this particular passage, and he's going to refer to two very, very important Old Testament characters and their accounts of how they came to faith in Christ. It's going to be a message that looks at faith and looks at works or our deeds or the fruit of our lives. And he's going to refer to Abraham and Rahab. Say Abraham. Abraham. Say Rahab. Rahab. Say Abraham, Rahab. And so we're going to read the story of Abraham first. Then we're going to read the story of Rahab so that we are completely up and fresh on what James is talking about by the time we get to his passage. So we're going to go to James' passage after that. So is everybody ready to go? Okay, here's what I need from you when we do this. So we're going to read Abraham. We're going to read Rahab. As we do, I need your imagination at maximum right now. Okay, I need you to enter into these stories with me. I need you to see the characters. Don't make them caricatures. Don't make them two-dimensional. Make them human. Right? See the pressure that they were under. See the emotion that they were going through. We, we do this sometimes. Like we went through Sunday school. We heard about these folks so much. We've got like this imagination halo over their heads the whole time that we talk about them. Don't do that today. I want you to see Abraham fresh and see Rahab. So let's dive in. Genesis 15, verse 5. Then the Lord took Abraham outside and said to him, look up into the sky And count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Now that might seem like a really big deal to you. But when God comes to Abraham in this moment, the father of the faith, when God comes to Abraham in this moment, Abraham's an old man, and his wife is an old woman. And God says, you're going to not only have kids, but you're going to have all these descendants that come out of your line, And Abraham's looking at this, and he's like, you know what? There's not a prescription pill that's going to make this better. And there is not a surgery that's going to make this better for me. I'm in the ancient world. That stuff is not available. How in the world is this going to happen? The power of God. And the power of God is the only way it's going to be able to happen. So God comes and makes his promise to him. And miraculously, it says that Abraham believed God that all these kids were going to come. And he says, look at the sky and and count the stars. And it's not like being in the big city and seeing like two stars in the sky, right? All the light pollution. It's like being out in the wilderness and you look up in the middle of the night and there's so many stars, there's no possible way you could count them. That's the experience that Abraham had. God makes this incredible promise and Abraham believes him. And notice it says, and then it was counted to his account as righteousness. That's Bible talk for when Abraham came to God and believed the word of God. He got saved. That's what it's saying. Is he had his moment of true conversion. Now I'm going to live a life trusting God. That's going to be important in just a second. So uh, we'll keep going. Um, Genesis 22 verse 1. It says, sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Now this sometime later is actually 30, 40 years later. It's a long time. Um, Sometime later, God had come to Abraham and he had done the miracle that he promised. And Abraham and Sarah had a little baby. 
And the baby's name was Isaac. And do you know what Isaac means in the Hebrew? It means laughter. It means laughter. They named him laughter because Sarah had laughed when God had made this crazy promise. So they have this baby. And they had been infertile most of their adult lives. And all of a sudden, this baby comes along. How much do you think they loved that baby? Like when you've been infertile, you've been hoping for children, you've been watching your friends have children, and you haven't had that experience, and all of a sudden you have that experience, and this beautiful baby boy is in front of you, you love them, right? You adore that child. The, the, the child is not only the fulfillment of your dreams, but it's a miracle of God. And so they lived 30 years with Isaac as he grows into adulthood, raising Isaac, adoring him, loving him. The world is about him. He's a single child, by the way. And you know what that's all about, right? And so he loves, loves, loves his child. So sometime later, when Isaac is in his 30s, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called, yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, God said, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moria, go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. Talk about a right turn in your walk with God. This is shocking. God's coming to him and saying, this child that I promised you, this child that is, is all about the fulfillment of the entire promise, this child who you love so much, and that's what God goes after first, right? Your son, your only son. Look at God's words. Your son, your only son, who you love so much. See, God knows what he's asking here. It's a terrible request. How in the world is Father Abraham, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had father, you Sunday school kids. <laughs> father Abraham, how in the world is Father Abraham going to deal with this, this command from God? There's three problems that it brings up for him just so we can be systematic about it. Problem number one is how can Abraham give up his very heart? This is his son, his only son who he adores. How in the world is this going to work? That's problem number one, and it's the worst problem. Problem number two is the God of the Bible, Yahweh, he does not do human sacrifice. Did you know that? That's not part of his deal. And as you go further into the Old Testament, there is no human sacrifice. Any, any of the pagan gods that are into human sacrifice, they are called explicitly the worst kind of evil. So Abraham's getting this from God. How in the world would God ask me to do human sacrifice? That's not what he's about. So that's problem number two. Problem number three is how in the world do we get the fulfillment of the promise if Isaac dies? And he struggles with those three problems, and he travels to Moria with his son. How in the world am I going to put all this together? Do you see how trapped he is? Do you see how difficult this is? And the book of Hebrews does this thing where it says, as he's traveling to Moria, there's a moment where Abraham hashes this out with God. And so I want you to imagine they've traveled to Moria. How, we don't even know how far this is away. Travels to Moria with Isaac, 30-year-old Isaac. And we're going to go sacrifice to, the, to God on this mountain. And the night before, imagine Abraham at a campfire. And he's trying to figure this out with God. And just imagine I, Isaac has fallen asleep. And so Abraham is whisper yelling at God. You ever whisper yell at God? You should. He's whisper yelling at God. How in the world is this going to work? You promised me. Why in the world will you give me a child, one that I love so much, and then ask me to hurt them? How, how many of you, if you were in Abraham's shoes, would have said, God, have Isaac sacrifice me, not the other way around. If you want there to be a death, make it my death, not his death. Wouldn't you have bargained with God? We would have said all of those things. And he's pouring his guts out. He's crying. And he's going through all of this stuff. And he, the, book, the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, it's the hall of faith passage, says that Abraham came to this conclusion in the middle of the night. and came to this conclusion that God was going to resurrect Isaac from the dead after the sacrifice was over. Which is just wild that he came to that conclusion because he had not seen resurrection up until that point. Why in the world would he think that? The reason he thought is because he's a man of faith and he's trying to put it together. He can't put it together, but he's trying to put it together. And he's like, I trust God through the agony, the pain, the confusion. I can't, but God, God will be faithful. 
and he trusted. You see how deep his faith was? I'm going to trust him. Verse 6, so Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders. And while he carried the fire and the knife, as the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham said. We have the fire, we have the wood, the boy said. But where is the sheep for the burnt offering? God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son, Abraham answered. And they both walked on together. Again, he's in his 30s. He's a smart guy. Where's the animal we're going to kill? Isaac does not yet know what's going on. Verse 9, when they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. And then he tied his son Isaac. Now Isaac knows. And laid him on the altar on top of the wood. How did that go? Because Isaac could take him. Old man. Whatever, old man. How, how, what are you doing? What's it? And then how does Isaac get to surrender? Okay. It's not described to us. But he ties up his son and he lays him down on the altar. And, and not only is, is Abraham surrendering to his father in heaven, but Isaac is somehow surrendering to his earthly father. Crazy stuff. And somehow the knife goes up in Abraham's hand. And can you imagine how full body trembling he is right now? And tears are streaming down. And I got to believe he's furious at God, that God would ask him to do this. Furious. But clinging to faith and trust in him as the knife starts to come down. And then the angel speaks. And you know That's what's going to happen, verse 11. And at that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know. And if you got your Bibles out, underline, now I know. Now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. And God says it again, your son, your only son. And, and, and for you scholars out there, he, what, what he's doing is he, he is pre-echoing John 3.16. When God's only begotten son will come for us. God's using that phrasing. So God tested Abraham. And what's the purpose of a test really quick? Have you taken classes before second service? Anybody here ever taken a test? Okay, you're with me. You've taken a test. What's the purpose of the test? What, what do you know? To reveal what has gone on inside of you onto the test. The test will reveal it. What is invisible, what is hidden, it will reveal it and make it known. Here's a second purpose of the test. You ever cram before the test? Just me, right? You cram before the test. And what do you do when you cram before the test? You've taken all this stuff that you've heard from this professor one time. And you take it all again and you reorganize it and you reorganize your thoughts and you go back through it again and you learn it a second time and everything goes way, way deeper, right? Because the process of getting ready for the exam does something to you and makes the whole thing solid and real. And both of these things happen in Abraham. It reveals the faith that was already inside of him, but it also takes him to a new place. God says, now I know. Here's the thing. God already knew didn't he? God already knew. But Abraham didn't know. And Abraham needed to know. A.W. Tozer has a, has a, just really a brilliant reading on this moment. And he says, you know, his belief is that what had happened is that father had had son and adored the son. And the son had come to that place in his life where the blessing of God became an idol against God. And it's not that we have a God who's needy here and needs to be the top or his, his, his personal, you know, whatever. is. It, it's not that. It's not needy God. It's a God who looks at a father and says, the blessing that I gave you, you've so adored him. You've so wrapped your whole life around him. He's become God in your life. And he's become the center of your world. 
And the more you make him that way, the more that relationship is going to destroy you and him both. And it's a dysfunctional love. And the only person that we can ever love that way in a safe way is God himself. And so what you've got is you've got the heavenly surgeon came in and said, the only way I can break this dysfunction in you, Abraham, is if I slide my hand in with the scalpel and cut just this one thing. And as soon as the knife went up, it was done. The purpose wasn't for Isaac to die. The purpose was that Abraham's heart would be fixed, healed, so he could love his son well. Rahab, Joshua, the book of Joshua, chapter 2. Then Joshua secretly sent out two spies from the Israelite camp at Acacia Grove, and he instructed them, scout out the land on the other side of the Jordan River, especially around Jericho. So the two men set out and came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there that night. Has anyone noticed the apples up here? I'm not going to explain them. These are meant to torture you so that you just wonder. Just kidding. Uh, We'll get to them eventually. Um, so Joshua is outside of the city of Jericho. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, 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 and the walls came tumbling down, right? Sunday school kids, love it. So this is the story. So, so 40 years after the Israelites come out of Egypt and God parts the Red Sea, right? And like they walk through on dry land and then they're gonna go to the land flowing with milk and honey. They get right up to that land, and right on the, the edge of it is Jericho, this, this high-walled city. It's, it's seen as impenetrable. It militarily, it's, it's, a, it's a huge challenge. And so Joshua, before they fight the battle, he sends two spies in there to gather military intel. Where are my soldiers at? Gather military intel. So they go in, and they go in on the down low, Right? And where do they stay? They stay at the house of a prostitute named Rahab. Now, why do these two men, these two spies, go to a prostitute's house? The Bible doesn't say. But I'm going to guess. Prostitutes know how to do things with discretion and may even have a skill of knowing how to hide men who don't want to be found. And she is also, she is not in the main area of the city. The scripture tells us that her house is built into the wall. She's in the poor district, not where things are going to be super public, super flashy. She's in the poor district. She's right on the wall. If you live in a fortified city, do you know where you want to live inside that city? In the center of it, not on the wall. She lives in the wall. She's not very wealthy at all. They go, they think discretion, no one's going to see us, and then they do see them. Verse 2, but someone told the king of Jericho, some Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent orders to Rahab, bring out the men who have come into your house, for they have come here to spy out the whole land. So even though she tried to hide them, It wasn't effective. The king found out, sent soldiers right to her house, and all of a sudden, I want you to imagine her front door is open, right? And the two spies are inside somewhere. And all of a sudden, the soldiers are there, and she's faced with a big moment here. What in the world am I going to do? Now, what's the safe play? The safe play is, yep, they're inside. I didn't know. I didn't know who they were. I let them in. I was really hoping you'd show up. Go take them, officer. That's the safe play. It's not what she's about to do. Now, before we get to the rest of it, you've got to hear some background in in Rahab's story. Think about the fact that she's a prostitute. Now, she shows up multiple times in Scripture. She's going to show up in the book of Luke. She's going to show up in Hebrews. She's going to show up in the book of James, of course, that we're reading today. And she's always called Rahab the prostitute. That's a huge thing about her past. What's going on in her life that would make this moment of challenge difficult? What's her level of trauma? What's her level of being abused and giving her body away for money in order to make ends meet? 
Is she living a safe lifestyle? No. Has she suffered? Yes. Has she been treated like property instead of like a soul made in the image of God? Yes. Over and over and over and over again. And what does that kind of abuse and trauma do to somebody? Let's just remember these are human beings, right? It's not flannel graph. Let's go there for a second. What does that do to her soul? What kind of therapy does she need to be in? How does she come to a place where she's ready to trust the God of Israel with her life? Because that's what she's about to do. Some of you are here today and you're like, I have a hard time with God. I've got trauma. I've got abuse in my past. Rahab's your story. She's your sister in the faith. She knows what you're talking about. She's been through it. Amen? So there they are. The soldiers are at the door. She's cracked the door open and they're talking to her and they're like, bring out the spies. She has her moment of decision. And this is her moment. And, and, and the thing is, guys, if, if, she doesn't, if she doesn't let them in, what happens if they just barge the door down and then they find the spies? She's going to be executed for treason. Probably her whole family to make an example out of her. Those are all likely outcomes here. Um, even, if, even if they don't barge her door down, even if they take her word for it at the door, um, the next day the battle of Jericho is going to happen. What if, what if the Israelites lose? And what if in the midst of the, of the loss, what if it's found out that she had done treachery like this? Again, she's executed probably her family along with her. She's got a whole lot to lose here. Verse 4, Rahab had hidden the two men, but she replied, Yes, the men were here earlier, but I didn't know where they were from. That's lie number one. They left the town at dusk as the gates were about to close. That's lie number two. I don't know where they went. Lie number three. If you hurry, you can probably catch up with them. Lie number four. <laughs> Verse 6, actually, she had taken them up. Now, I love that the narrator of the book of Joshua jumps in here and says, actually, because everything she said is a lie up until this point. Actually, what had happened, she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them beneath bundles of flax that she had laid out. And so the king's men went trouncing off, looking for the spies. So she had just crossed the point of no return. She had made her decision, and she had made her decision for Yahweh and for his people. And this wasn't her native people, nor was it her native religion that she had grown up with since she was a kid. And she protected God's people, and she lied like crazy. And God, in the story, is about to use, for his divine purposes, a lying prostitute. Right? God is the God of the universe is about to use for his divine purpose a lying prostitute. Why is that important? Some people come to me as a pastor and they say, you know, I can't lead this life group because I don't know enough Bible. God just used for his divine purposes a lying prostitute. I think he can use you. It's not about you, it's about God. I don't know if I can raise these kids to fear Jesus because I've got this kind of a past. God is about to use a lying prostitute to accomplish his divine purpose. Sometimes we make ourselves so big in the equation and we make God so small, don't we? Got to get over ourselves just a little bit. Verse 8, before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up on the roof to talk to them. I know the Lord has given you this land, she told them. We are all, look at this, afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror. That's all of Jericho. For we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. So she's heard of what happened 40 years ago in Egypt. You know, Charlton Heston holds up the staff and the waters part. Like that got around. No YouTube in those days, right? No nightly news, but it still got around. So here she is. She's like, we, heard, we all know about that. And then next, she says, and we know that you did what you did to Sihon and Og, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. That was a battle that had just happened recently. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. For the Lord your God, she means Yahweh here, is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. 
She's saying, I believe. She's saying, of all the gods in the ancient world, even the gods that I grew up with in Jericho, she's like, Yahweh is God. And she's like, I know it, and I believe it. So you remember Abraham? See, his test with Isaac came after his belief and his heart changed. Do you remember that? There was faith first, and then the actions came later. Now you got the same thing with Rahab. She's like, the reason I just did that, just so you know, is because months ago, maybe even years ago, I already drew the conclusion that everybody that's worshipped in our society, all these false gods, they're false gods, and yours is the real God, and I was ready to worship the real God. Before the soldiers ever arrived, the spies ever arrived at her house, she was already there with God. That's what she's telling them. Faith first, works come later. That's what you see in her life. I think that's so powerful. Rahab had a past, and she had trust issues, but God still used her, amen? She, like I said, she shows up in Luke. She shows up in Hebrews. She shows up in James. And every single time, she's called Rahab the prostitute. Now, when I was a, a little kid in Sunday school, it was Rahab the harlot because none of us knew what harlots meant, and that made it, made it okay for us to talk about, right? Rahab the prostitute. You're like, but that's her old life. Why does the Bible keep referring to her according to her old life? I think this is why. Some of you guys have got a trauma or a difficulty in your past that was such a high level of bondage to you. Maybe it was addiction. And God rescued you from it. And when you go to other people and you tell them the testimony of how deep you were in the darkness and how much God rescued you from the glory doesn't go to you. It goes to God. And I think this is what the Bible is doing when they say, Rahab, the lying prostitute. But look at how God used her. Because that's not her identity, right? She's not stuck in the past. And she didn't stay stuck in the past, by the way. So she rescued the, rescues the spies. And then the miracle happens, right? And the walls come tumbling down, right? And then Jericho's defeated. And she's saved. And the Bible says that she becomes an Israelite after that time. And then she marries a guy named Salmon. It just looks like salmon when you look at it. He's not a fish. He's a guy. Salmon. She marries this guy. So this Israelite guy marries this, this, this Gentile prostitute. Marries her. Jewish tradition says it was one of the two spies was Salmon. He was so impressed with her speech. Fell in love with her. They got married. They had a little boy. Guess what the little boy's name is? Boaz. Shows up in the book of Ruth. Amazing guy. So not only is Rahab saved physically out of the dark life that she was in, she's not just saved and then launched at some kind of neutral spiritual experience. No, God's got lots for her. Right? It's like, I got family for you. Boaz is going to come out of your line, and you're going to raise him in the faith. And Boaz is this amazing guy in the book of Ruth. And guess who she's the great, great grandma of? King David. And then you read the book of Luke. And guess, guess who's in the line of Jesus Christ as an ancestor? Rahab. That's why she shows up in Luke 3. And then Hebrews 11 talks about her as well. She's amazing. Are you ready for James chapter 2, verse 14? Let's go. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? James is going to go out after this thing about faith and works. Remember that first step that Abraham and Rahab took? And then the works came later. He's going to look at this, and and this, this becomes this really, really controversial, hard to understand passage, but becomes easier to understand if you know the story of Abraham and Rahab. So, what does he say first here? James is saying, You cannot have an invisible faith. Done. An invisible faith won't save you. Like, if I look at that chair right there, James would say, Do you have faith in that chair? I guess I heard this before, right? Yes, I have faith in that chair. Let me explain to you the structural reasons why I can have faith in that chair. I can give you all kinds of information. James says, don't give me all kinds of information. Just sit down. Well, I'd rather not sit. I'm not really feeling like sitting right now. James says, why aren't you feeling like sitting right now? Well, I don't know. You don't have faith in the chair unless you sit. You sit 
is the actions that show the faith was there in the first place. Abraham passing the test is the proof. It's the visible proof of what had happened in his heart long ago. Because let's be real. When it says that Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness, who could see that? Nobody. It was invisible. God's special x-ray eyes could see it. But Abraham couldn't, neither could Sarah, neither could anybody around him. Verse 15, suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say, goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm and well and eat well. And then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? Now he twists it. We're not talking about chairs anymore. We're talking about people. And he sets up this scenario and says, there's a guy in your church and don't be fooled. This isn't some guy who's got like, you know, his third car and he's worried about make, making the car payment on his third car. You know, this isn't first world problems kind of thing for James. So now he's talking, about, he's talking about a guy who's truly destitute. Bad situation. This guy has got no good clothes. He's got no coat and it's going to be freezing cold tonight. What's this guy going to do? That's what he's hitting you with. This guy may not have another meal to eat. What are you going to do with this guy? And James imagines a Christian in the church, in the same church, sees this guy, sees the situation he's in, and says, you know what? You ought to eat a sandwich. Man, go eat a sandwich. And you know what? And I'm believing God for a great coat for you. Believe in God for a fur coat. See you later. Have a great day. James says, if as a Christian, you can say stuff like that without helping the destitute guy out, you might not be a Christian. This is that moment in the message. Ugh. You might not be a Christian. Verse 17. So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now someone may argue, hey, some people have faith over here. Other people have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith. By my good deeds. Verse 19, you say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without deeds is useless? <laughs> what a great argument. Even the demons believe. Do you know Satan is not an atheist? Satan is not an atheist. Why? Because he's been in the very throne room of God. He's seen him. He's talked to him. Book of Job shows us that. Satan, Satan's got a better handle on the Bible than you do. The, the theology of the demons is more precise than your pastor's handle on theology is. I guarantee you. Because they see it every day. But that knowledge and that belief does not save them from hell. So if your whole thing is like, man, I got Bible down, I got theology down, I like jumping on those YouTube videos, you know, and just destroying those guys when they get stuff wrong. James is like, that's, that's not real faith. So he breaks it down three ways is what he's done so far. Real faith is more than. And, and, and the opposite may be fake faith. Real faith is more than. Can I give you three, actually four things? I keep forgetting I added the fourth one this morning. Real faith is more than the emotions I feel. So sometimes I walk up to the guy who's in need and I'm like, oh, be warm and well fed. Oh, I feel you, man. I feel you. Right? Like you, you watch the sad puppy dog videos and they're like, give money to the sad puppy dogs. Right? And then what do you do? You move on to the next video. Right? Like you feel it, but you don't do anything about it. And that's what he's like, the feelings, it's not enough. And in church, it's the same way. But God, I was in the worship service and the music got going and I really felt something. I really felt something stir. The emotions are not enough. Number two, the words I say are not enough. Be warm and well fed. Just because you said it doesn't mean it's real. And some of us, we know how to sing the songs. We know how to pray the prayers. Some of us have even been in the ministries and taught some of the lessons. But the truth is it's not real in you. The religion that I practice doesn't matter if you go to church. Doesn't matter if you think that you're part of the church. What's gone on deep inside of your soul that God can see may not be 
real, the truth that I believe. We've already covered that one. Um, when I grew up in church, grew up as a good kid, grew up as a church kid, we were in the church every single time the church was open. We were there first and we were there last. I pushed the broom around the uh, fellowship hall and was always the, the one who was sweeping the floor, right? Because mom was talking to somebody. She was doing ministry with somebody and I was just always there. Right? Like VBS, we never missed a VBS. We were always there for everything. And I grew up in a Christian school. I was a Christian school until I was in eighth grade. And I memorized whole psalms, okay? I can recite them to you today. I knew the books of the Bible from the front to the back. And, and we did these Bible drills. Have you ever done the Bible drill where it's like you hold up the Bible and the binding is right here and they yell out the, the, the reference and you, who's first? To, it, was, it was always me. I would destroy you in Bible quiz. I had you. I had all that down. I knew about the songs. I knew about revival services and how I was supposed to talk about Bible services because I grew up immersed in it all, right? Like I had all the lingo totally down. I knew how I was supposed to behave. I, I had the whole thing. I was the best fake you ever saw in your life. And man, I could fool youth leaders. I go to the Christian concerts and I'd get emotional. I go to Christian camp and on the last day and they'd have the bonfire, you know, and they'd have the, the whole walk forward and all the thing. Like I, I knew exactly what to say to those people to make them think that I was the real deal. And it wasn't. And the reason I know that, I can look back on it now and know that is because everything about my life during those teen years was, was all about me. And it was all about like I used people as a means to an end. Like, if you were going to help me achieve a, a greater social status, I was going to use you for that. You weren't really my friend. I didn't actually like you, care about you. I was just using people. I was using uh, girls that were in my life. Won't go into that. Was using them. And I would do whatever I wanted to do. And I had no concept of the fact that the Holy Spirit grieves when we sin. Do you know that? The Holy Spirit grieves when we sin. When we claim to be a Jesus Christ follower and then we don't live as Jesus Christ lives, it grieves the Holy Spirit. But I didn't care. I'd do whatever I want to do, whatever my agenda was. And I just got so used to living my own life and then showing up on Sunday morning. And it was like this shell of stone was around my soul because I got so used to it. I got so used to that life and this life. And I could run in between the two different spheres. No problem. And the reason I could is because it wasn't real in me. James, why in the world do you write a passage like this? going to freak us all out, make us wonder whether or not we've got fake faith. Because Josh Trueblood is sitting there in a pew on a Sunday morning. He doesn't know he's going to hell. And somebody better warn him. And that's why. Pastor Ed Meyer, when... When I got saved at 18 and went to college and Linda and I met and we're so pumped about our faith, radically saved, giving everything to God, turn our worlds upside down, right? And we met this guy named Pastor Ed Meyer. And I mean, this is the kind of pastor that you just like want to go away for a weekend with this guy and just sip coffee and let him like love you and talk to you the whole time. So wise, so loving, just wonderful guy, Pastor Ed Meyer. And he sh shares with us this one time, and, and he had helped us on so many different things. And at one point, he shares his testimony, and he's like, I was a pastor as an adult for years in a church. And then one day, Billy Graham came to town, and a friend, pastor friend of mine took me to this Billy Graham crusade, and I went to this Billy Graham crusade, and I got saved. I'm like, wait, you got that out of order. You were a pastor, and then you got saved. Yep. Yep. Why? Because he had grown up in it and he knew all the lingo and knew how to play the part. Didn't know. He didn't know. He didn't know it wasn't real. I didn't know when I was a teen that it wasn't real. I wasn't trying to fool anybody. And all of a sudden, a clear gospel got presented to Pastor Ed Meyer. <laughs> how hard do you think it was for him to walk down to the front? Holy Spirit came in in power showed him what was what, gave his life to Christ. He was a better pastor after that, right? 
Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, look at this. For it is by grace you've been saved, and it's through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, and it's not by works, so that no one can boast. And this is one of the clearest passages in the New Testament about this. Hold what James is saying up to this, and it, it, it starts to clarify. When you give your heart to God and you become saved, it's like that moment with Abraham. Am I going to trust? Am I going to throw myself on Jesus and trust him? Say, take my life. Remember in Revelations chapter 3 where he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, the door of your heart, and I'm knocking, and will you let me in? And guess what? Whose hand is on the door handle? Yours is. And you either let him in or you don't. That's your choice. But that's also your potential salvation moment is to open the door for him and to swing it open wide and say, God, take my whole life. And if you do that, and if it's real, then you change. You become something different. And that's the Abraham moment. That's the Rahab moment that happened way back here before the works ever came along. But the works show that it actually happened. So you need another verse. Here's another one for you. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So if you've had that moment of salvation... You spiritually change into a whole recreation. What's he trying to describe there? He's saying you don't just enter somebody's membership roster. You fundamentally change. Like if you could see the DNA spiritually, you just became a whole different animal. Recreated. One of the great things about Marvel, right, and all the superheroes Yes, I am a nerd. Uh, Marvel and all the superheroes. What's so great about it is there's always like a radioactive spider, right? There's always something like that or a special room that they walk in or a crazy pill that they take. How in the world did the superhero become the superhero? How did they genetically become something completely different? And some of you know they go up into like solar light storms and stuff like that and they come back completely different and that's how they got their superpowers, right? Genetically changed. And that's kind of the idea, is you change completely. And then Jesus is going to say the same thing, but he's going to say it better because Jesus always says it better. Matthew 7, 7, 17, a good tree, Jesus says, produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can produce bad fruit. Bad tree, tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify, and this is the critical point, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, is it a pear tree? Is it an apple tree? Is it an orange tree? What kind of tree is it? You identify it by its fruit. So you can identify people by their actions. See, Jesus said this way before James did. It's your actions that show. And not only is it your actions that show, but it's your actions that show what the DNA is. Like, you cannot today say, well, I'm just going to try really hard, Pastor, and I'm going to be a little bit more Mother Teresa than I was before. And I'm going to try really hard. You know what that's like? That's like you going and grabbing a bushel of apples and dropping it at the base of your tree. Say, how's this look now? Maybe I'll take some of them and I'll scotch tape them to my branches. No. Either these are real or they're not. And they grow from the tree. You can't make these happen. Now I'm really going to mess with you. You can't make these happen. Because that's what all those religious people did in the book of James is they came with all these fake ways to look like a Christian. Nobody could have told Abraham what his test was going to be. But when the moment came, the fruit was created. Same thing with Rahab. Either the DNA is there or it's not. So this isn't the message we're going to get to the end of, and I'm going to give you the list of things that you ought to do better. I'm not going to do that. It's what you want. It's what I want when I read this passage. But that's not it. The one work you have to do is to swing the door open of your heart to Jesus Christ. Because that's the only thing that makes you an apple tree. And if you're not an apple tree, you 
don't have the power to make these. Not really. Verse 21, don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened just as the scriptures say. Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. So you see, we are shown to be right. James says it like three times. We're shown to be righteous. You're shown to have the DNA, the faith. We're shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. He's saying Abraham was an apple tree. That's what James is saying. Verse 25, Rahab the prostitute is another example. She was shown to be right with God, shown to be right by her actions when she hid the messengers and sent them away safely by a different road. Just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without works. End with this. When I was radically saved, And God got a hold of me, and I finally did change. See, one of the things you can do with James here is you can look at this and say, does it mean I got to work harder? Does it mean I got to be perfect? No, Rahab wasn't perfect, was she? In the midst of all of her lies, God is still using her. Somehow, in the midst of all those lies, this little thing pokes out, (laughs) right? God sees it. So anyway, so I get radically saved, and I know nothing. I just want everything that God has for me. I think maybe 19 years old, and one of the things I saw in the book of Acts is there would be people who would go and, and ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit is what they would call it, and they would want people to come and lay their hands on them and pray for them seriously and say, God, I want all of you. I want every single part of you. I want everything that I can have from you. Fill my life. Get rid of me. Fill me with you. Right? And they would do that. And some of you are freaked out by that little phrase. I'm just going to pretend that you're not and keep going. So I wanted that. And sometimes it's associated with getting certain spiritual gifts. And I wanted those spiritual gifts. And so I invite some people over to my dorm room. And I said, pray for me like this. And so they set this chair in the middle of my dorm room and these people came around me and they started to pray for me. Oh God, fill him with your spirit and all this. And I'm all ready, you know. And God didn't give me any of those gifts I was looking for that night. But what he did is there was this really weird moment in the middle of the prayer And it was like somebody took an external audio source and plugged it into the amplifier of my brain and I just started to hear someone else talking and I wasn't forming the thoughts myself. Pastor, are you saying you heard voices? Yes, sorry. I started hearing this voice and it's God's voice and it's a word of prophecy. He's speaking truth to me, father to son. He just starts speaking to me. And there was a long message that he gave me, but part of it, was this phrase, and I'll show it to you here. Nothing that you've done will remain, just what you do for me. Because I had grown up in this way, trying to do all this stuff, and God was trying to make a point to me. Nothing that you've done will remain, just what you do for me. What he's saying here is, you're not going to be perfect. And you're going to keep screwing stuff up. And there's going to be opportunities to help people, and you're going to miss them. And then you're going to regret it later on. And you're just, and, and you did that bef- before. And even now as a Christian, you're going to keep screwing stuff up. Rahab kept screwing stuff up. But guess what? The first part of the line, nothing that you've done will remain. That's the cross of Jesus Christ. See, that's, that's Jesus coming in saying, all of that sin, it's wiped out and you're clean forever. Like the past, the present, the future, I got you. Like you come and you swing the door of your heart open to me and you're a new creation. I've completely cleaned all the bad away. All Rahab's lies, all her past, all her prostitution, gone. Just what you do for me remains. (laughs) 
So the Christian life is this amazing trapeze act with the greatest net ever. So I get to fly. I get to run. And I get to try to do stuff for God. And most of the stuff that I try is junk. But every once in a while, an apple grows off the tree. Right? Nothing that you've done will remain just what you do for me. That's my life. And that's my story. Do you have real moments like that in your life? That's the question. Would you guys stand right now? I'm gonna, I, I gotta describe a couple things to you, but I'm gonna take you through a prayer right now. Because James didn't share this all with us for theology. He shared it with us because he was desperately concerned about people in his churches who might not really be Christians. And some of you guys have heard this today, and, and I'm especially thinking about the middle schoolers in the room, the high schoolers in the room, the people that grew up in church, and, and it just never became real for you. And some of you guys are hearing this whole thing, and you're like, that's me. Just like Pastor Josh, just like Pastor Ed Meyer, that's me. And if that's you, I want you to get that settled today. I want you to pray, and I want you to swing the door of your heart open to Jesus. Because you can do that today. You can experience the change today. Amen? So we're going to pray. And, and, and when I have you close your eyes, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and tell me that you want to be part of this prayer. I want you to be bold. Abraham was bold. Rahab was bold. Take a bold step. Let's pray. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. If you're part of this today and you would just say, you know what, God is speaking to me right now. He's convicting me. Maybe I've had a fake faith, whatever. I want it to be real. Say, I want it to be real today. If you want this to be your salvation moment, would you boldly raise your hand right now and raise it high? I want you to raise it high. A lot of us today. Amen. Amen. We're going to pray these phrases together. Everybody say them out loud. Nobody's going to stand out. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, save me. Recreate me. I want to be done with my past. Forgive my sin. Make me new. I want to walk with you, Jesus. I give you my life completely. Thank you, Lord. Amen.